Good morning and welcome to the PR show, A Strong Opinion in a Strong Voice. So I'm sitting here with my beautiful, wonderful friend from all the way from Hamburg, Martina Zerger. I don't know if I pronounce it well, but... <laughs> you did very well, Rika. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself, your background, where you come from, what you're doing. Yes. So I am, I'm born in Germany and I am married since 39 years now to my husband and uh, we have six children, uh, but I need to say that five children are alive um, because one of our children, our first child died 24 years ago in the age of two. So we are happily married. We are a happy family. We pastor a church here in Hamburg and we are busy with helping people and just uh, stretching out to people everywhere we go and everywhere we are. So today I would like to talk about the topic of grief and uh, or actually healthy grieving because there is a uh, there is a unhealthy way of grieving, but there's also a way of grieving, which is actually a process every person has to take who has experienced loss, especially loss in a larger sense. Because loss in general is part of our life. There are smaller losses and there are big losses so but smaller losses like for example you had an appointment with a friend and he did not come because he forgot it or some daily things of life they can they can feel like a loss and they can uh, 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 a small sense of grief but what so in in that way it's part of our life we experience happy days and not so happy days good days bad days but today we want to focus more about what happened to you when you have experienced in your life uh, a bigger loss a large loss maybe you lost a loved one maybe um you lost uh, your parents because of divorce. Maybe you lost your home. Maybe you lost um, a job you, you have been for maybe decades. And all of you found yourself without being there. These are major events in our life which can be like a trauma, which do deep emotional things inside of us, which cause a deep grief. And we are facing this situation and we, we need to ask ourselves, how can I maneuver myself through this situation without doing myself harm to me? That's what we are talking about. How you can how you can go on with your life while still grieving, but that not affecting your day to day life. Exactly, and this is actually uh, this is actually a process uh, which can go for many months, uh, uh, according to what has happened. But this and and interestingly is that this process has different stages. So, and, and this is what I would love to do, uh, say general um, about grief, but also look at, at these different stages. In general, there are 10 stages in this process when we walk ourselves in a healthy and much sure way through the grieving process in our daily life. Can you share, if you would, a little bit about how this came to happen in your life? Well, I we lost our child um, very sudden. Actually, I went to to a checkup with the doctor. The the normal checkup you have to do when you have a, a, a smaller child. 
So, and actually the doctor congratulated me to this healthy child, but uh, a few weeks later, he had all of a sudden, he had breathing problems. And since it was end of April, beginning of May, and everything here in Germany start to blossom, my first thought was, well, does the little one has a spring allergic reaction because my older son, he had a spring allergic and he needed to take some medicine in this part of, in the season of the year. So I called our our doctor who was uh, which uh, who was very familiar to us uh, we knew him a long time he 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 knew our our family the children well so i called him up and i said well it seems the little one who is reacting to all the blossoming of the trees and flowers so what shall i do with this 2 year old boy so he gave me some advice and said, try and call me back after a few days. But instead of um, getting better, it got worse, worse and worse with each day. And the little one had serious, serious breathing problems. So after three, four days, I called the doctor back and I said, listen, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Uh, so I went to the children's doctor. Was the breathing, uh, uh, sorry, was the breathing problem a, a continuous thing or just occasionally? Every it, breath he took, it was labor? Yes, every breath he took, it was labor. It was a continuing. And um, so we, it was really serious and we were very, very uh, concerned. Of course. So we went to the children's doctor and the children's doctor um, uh, checked the lungs and asked me and said, something is wrong with the left lung. So did he maybe swallow something, which is a child in the age of two, they, they put everything in their mouth. Of course. So it, it, the question was good. And I said, well, I did not see him put anything in his mouth, but you never know in that age, you never know. So that's why the doctor said, you know what, let's be sure, let's make an X-ray and just let's check. And it was in the same house and I just could go over with the little one. And um, so the, uh, an x-ray was taken and the doctor who took the x-ray when he looked at at the results he he was very alarmed and immediately called the ambulance he said the whole left lung of your little one is um Collapse. uh, collapsed mm -hmm. it does not work anymore and the heart is pushed to the right side in his little breast. Wow. So with, with alarm, the ambulance rushed him to the hospital. And uh, there he they gave him, first of all, they gave oxygen because his little breast all, almost was like this. It was not going down. His breast, the ribs were always difficulties to breathe his little ribs had almost gone up wow. so they gave him oxygen in order to release a little bit of this labor of of um, breathing and then they they did um, the uh, how do you say that in english the uh, tomography they they did this other uh, checking where where you have through that tunnel machine. And, yes, yes yes i know what it means yeah i know exactly yes machine. yeah thank you i i <laughs> no problem uh so they checked that and when they looked on that pictures they said you know what we do not do it here in this hospital we rushed him to the university hospital in town so they rushed him to the other hospital here and um, we were like, we were already like in a shock 
Of because course. in the morning we thought, well, he has a spring allergic and just went for further check and further advice for the doctor from, from the children's doctor and found ourselves in hospitals surrounded by super alarmed doctors and professionals and professors know what to do. So we ended up being there in the university hospital and um, 15 doctors, professors, specialists surrounded us and him. And uh, they were discussing in front of us what to do now. So I said to the doctors, um, well, uh, what is the plan? And they said, we are sorry, we do not have any plan. Or they we identify the problem, they just didn't know the cause of it, or what was the problem? In that moment, they just knew that the left lung was collapsed and it looked like as if a tumor has surrounded the left lung and just crushed it. And this is why they said, you know what? Next tomorrow morning, he will be the first in operation because we have to find out what kind of tumor is it in order to make any further steps of planning and how the medication has to be. Of course. So they scheduled him to be the first one. And he was, of course, on the intensive care station. And back then, it was not allowed for the parents to stay. Wow. So we had to drive home, which was very hard. And it was late already. And we had our other four kids at home. So we drove home and uh, we were very concerned. Of course. And uh, so my husband and I talked and, and we de decided... Um, uh, that he would get up very early at five and then rush to the hospital because our little one would, he was uh, somebody who would wake up early at 5.30, 6. So we wanted to make sure that when he wakes up next morning that mommy or daddy would be of there course. at his bedside. So we decided that he would do that part while I would stay at home and take care of the four other children, preparing them to go to school. All of them were in school and so that the normal life for them would go on and continue. And then we would see what, uh, what the doctors would tell us after the operation. How much did the other children at this point knew? Not more than we. They just knew what somehow his left lung did not work and and uh, that we did not know why and and so that was all they knew and that he has serious breathing problems hmm. so i stayed at home and i had to um i had to uh, do some preparations because our second old daughter in two days was supposed to uh, <clears throat> what is the english word when uh, in state church, the, the young, the teenies, they have two years of Bible, uh, um, Bible education, Bible study by the pastor. And then after two years, they have a kind of graduation. Uh -huh. So that was supposed to be in, uh, uh, in the next two days. So I had to do some preparation, finish finishing preparation. And the phone rang and my husband was at the phone. And the way he, uh, uh, he named himself, the voice, the sound of his voice told me everything. Wow. This is something grief when you have suffered a loss, it will be part of your life. This is now 24 years ago, but it is still part 
of our life. And this is one of the lessons we needed to learn that this we have to live with. Mm. It will be part of our life, part of memory, part of, it has shaped us. Of course. It has shaped us as, as a person, me as person, my husband as person, each one of our children, is, it has shaped us as a couple, but also it has shaped us as a family. And this is the first advice I want to give. We realized back then very quick that as each individual person and as a couple and as a family, that we needed to make a quality decision because we knew because of our ministry as pastors, youth pastors, we have, we have ministered many years as youth pastors before we ministered as pastors of a church. We knew that losses like that or trauma like that can, um, can tear apart a couple, a marriage or a family. So, and because of that, we said to each other, we will make a quality decision that this loss, this tragedy will not tear our marriage and our family apart, but will bring us even closer together. And this is something emotions go wild, but making the quality decision is like giving you a ground you can stay on even when and while your emotions are going wild. So it wasn't, and just to explain to my audience, it wasn't, uh, you didn't wait for your emotions to support your decisions. You first decided and then your emotions followed. Exactly. We first, it might be, and this is the first stage of a grieving process. Of course, the, the first stage is the state of shock. Of course. So we faced a total shock. So when my husband called me from hospital, and could not speak because of the, the reality that our little one just had died. Um, my, my first reaction was to bring the children together and rush to the hospital. And I realized, well, maybe it is better that I, I myself do not drive the car. But so I called a friend and I asked her, could you please drive me and the children to the hospital? Our little one just had died. And her first reaction without thinking was, no, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. Why? Because she was so shocked. She was yeah, so she shocked. She herself was impacted too much. Yes, she was. She she said, "This is too much," and then I said, "Please, I need you because my other friends I could not reach. They were working." Yeah, and um, so I said to her, "If you do not drive me, I need to drive myself, and I'm First. concerned to drive myself in this state." So we rushed to the hospital, and um, I I brought my children out of school. We rushed there. And then later the day when we all were back home, we had to leave him in the hospital there. And when we were back home, did, did he pass overnight? That no, he didn't pass overnight. He died during the operation. Oh, he so he was operated on then. He was operated, and they took out a little bit of the tumor in order to check what kind of tumor it is. And they were, and they had given him uh, uh, oxygen directly to the lung. Okay. So they were suing all this. Uh, Parsons, they yeah. were in the process of finishing when all of a sudden the heart stood still. So they, for one and a half hours, the doctors tried to reanimate him, of course, and to make him breathe again, but with no success. Did they so, ever explain what was the problem, really? I mean, did they not calculate with this risk? Because that seems to be just 
almost like a, a, a doctor of malpractice. I honestly, I cannot tell you if they have calculated the risk. I assume they did because the doctor who was uh, in charge of the operation, a few weeks later, he visited us in wow. our home, in our house, because for him, it was very, very um, shocking and difficult as well. And he, he reached out to us. He wanted to to help us and us from the medical perspectives yes. background yes. and information kind of a back information yes. yes and the support he could give so that's I, it, unusual i think very unusual and we were we were very grateful that he did that yes yeah. so, and he, he again he showed us the the pictures of the x-ray and the other uh, check and explained the state of the lung and um, that the tumor has pushed the heart on the right side. So what they told us was that it was for the little heart just too much. Too much. Yeah. yeah. But did they, what, what I wanted to find out is that did they tell you beforehand that this could be a possible outcome of the operation? No. That's they what I'm did. saying. Something is, doesn't seem right. From their part, well, they should have, have mentioned it at least, don't you think? Well, you have to fill a formula when the doctor of anesthesia comes, so they they inform you beforehand. In general, yeah, what can happen yeah. during an operation. This they do, and then they ask you to sign this. Every or basically a disclaimer right. that you take every responsibility and they take none. It almost sounds like that, that uh, you have to sign that they have informed you yeah. about the general risks and that you have understood. And so this is what they want to make sure. So wow. this is this is what was uh, what they told us in general but um yeah it just doesn't seem right because they should have told you at least specifically that you know we have 50 50 percent of chance and then do you agree to the operation as a care as a primary care, care, caretaker of the child or you don't but obviously you had no choice because you know we had no choice because because uh, they they needed to know what kind of tumor it was and then we found out because this I'm talking about a span, a time span of 10 days. Before these 10 days, he was healthy and happy. Yeah. And after 10 days, he was dead. So it was a very short time span. And from these 10 days, nine days, we thought he has serious allergic breathing yeah. problems. Yeah. And, and then in between of 24 hours going from serious breathing problems to having a dead child. So it was very sudden. It was a very shock. And so when we came back on that day home, we gathered the children. We, we prayed together. We wept together. We explained to the children as good as we could what happened and why. And then we did this quality decision, first as a couple and then as a family. And we prayed with our children. And looking back now, after 24 years, I can say that this quality decision has shaped for each one of us um, the way we went through the grieving process the next years. Because all in all, at least it took us five years to come over it or go through it. So this is um, um, the state of shock as... 
Uh, I'm, I, uh, I read a book uh, recently and I really want to recommend this book. Uh, it is uh, not a thick book and I want, would like to show it. Wow. This book is um, Good Grief by Granger E. Westberg, A Companion for Every Loss. And this book is a nutshell. It's not, not very thick. It's a nutshell and is very, very um, insightful and helpful. So we were the first stage, and this was what we were facing. We were in a total state of shock. And, and the state of shock can last for minutes, can last for hours, can last for days. And in some cases, it can even last for two or three or maybe four weeks. And uh, I call it the anesthesia for the soul. Yeah. When it's too much for the soul yes. to take in, it just shut down. The, 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 the soul just shuts down. It's a yeah. kind of an escape of reality. Yeah, in order to you switch into survival mode. So yes. that you can still function, you have to kind of push down everything that's there. Yes, and this goes unconsciously. You, you, of course, you decide it just that's a, a natural defense mechanism and a built in defense mechanism, exactly. And then, like having a medical anesthesia for an operation, when you feel the anesthesia is lifting, yeah, so uh, slowly. The, the feelings come back and, and uh, the ability to, to move the part of your body with, which maybe was under anesthesia. And this, this is the same grieving process. The second stage is you start to feel emotions. The, so the bad emotions are coming back as well, isn't it? You, you begin, but but you began to feel the pain as well. Yes, you you start to feel emotions, and the first thing what you feel, what you start to feel with the whole weight is the pain. And also, gradually in the second stage, you you start to be able to slowly express emotions. Mm. So, and, and um, the biggest hurdle in this critical phase is accepting the emotions and accepting that you are emotional. As That's opposed the to biggest denying hurdle. Them. As opposed to denying them, correct? Exactly, because unconsciously the soul builds barriers. Yes. Because the soul does not want to feel the pain. Exactly. And so you have to, to be aware in this stage that you have one day, you have to face your emotions. You have to face situation you are in. And you have to become capable and able to face, to accept this state you are in these emotions these mm, it's like you are you have wrestling inside you know that you need to face these emotions you need to face reality but on the other side you don't want of course <laughs> of course you don't want to because, because it's just too much too much and too harsh yeah yeah so and this is um this is where we need to take ourselves by our hand and kind of steer us through the rough waters of turmoil and emotions mm -hmm. and um, to allow ourselves to express the emotions. You first you allow you yourself to heal and then you allow yourself to express, correct? Yes, yes. And also to allow yourself to, um, that it is a wide, maybe a wide range of emotions. So for me, for weeks, I had from deepest despair to anger and 
all sorts of emotions and hopelessness. It was a wide range of emotions, but okay, that's how it is in that phase, in that moment. Yes. And um, just important to understand that we have a soul and we need to deal with that soul and need to help our soul. A kind, kind of um, maybe like if you need to help a child mm -hmm. to, to deal with a certain situation which is very difficult for the child. Yeah. And, and in, that, in that stage, um, it is also very important, um, don't apologize for your emotions. It's okay. Allow it's okay. yourself to feel. And to Allow feel. yourself to feel what you feel. Don't apologize. In this stage, it is a, a very important that you, you allow the emotions to be. And you look at them, you face that but just allow it mm -hmm. because if you stuff it one day, um, these emotions will come back, but of then course. it will harm you. Of course. Yeah. So, and, and that leads to the third stage. Um, after a few weeks or a few months, it's, it's, you, you can never, you can never say, well, this stage lasts that long and this stage lasts that long. It is individually different. So, but after the second stage comes the third stage. And this is the stage where we feel very depressed and very lonely. That is when the reality has landed. That's when reality hits. Yeah. So when, when, it, when it has a sink in uh, that you have that loss, it is as it is. And now um, you need to face it and you need to find for yourself a way how to live with it. That's right. That. Yeah. So um, it is... An awful experience. We have experienced that. Of course, the, the first reaction of friends and community is they, they write letters. Back then it was letters. Mm -hmm. Maybe today it would be emails or, or text messages. But back then it was letters. And I, I prefer that. Because holding a piece of paper with um, uh, words of... Um, uh, uh, consolidation or words of just warm words. Yes. It's a different thing than having your, your iPhone and a text message. Yeah. It's, it's something different. They, they take nice cards and try to express their sympathy. And uh, so, but after that, this comes in the first one, two, three, maybe four weeks after the loss. But then and this is the most crucial state. But then for the other people, um, uh, it's back to life, back to normal life. life and they have, they, they have to go on with their life, of course. But for you, all of a sudden, when the telephone doesn't ring no more that often, when no letters are coming in no more, when when... Uh, no friend is just being at the door and coming, coming and give you a short visit and, and a short hug. When all this stops, then you are going to face this third stage and you feel lonely and you feel depressed because you find yourself all alone with handling your new normal life with this loss. What I wanted to ask regarding this phase, doesn't it help when you have a, a similarly um, grieving family around you? Or everybody, seems to be alone. or everybody seems to be alone with their grief? Yes, it, it depends a lot how the family members uh, are dealing with their own grief. 
because after our loss for for several years we helped other couples who had to go through the same experience as we had to go through uh, losing a child and we found out in helping other couples that it is very different very individual some some family members they just shut down yeah. each one in their own grief or um uh, they they try to they try to go to back to normal as quick as possible yeah. try to manage yeah try to, to manage. normalize the situation normalize their yes. lives yeah for yeah them. yeah exactly so it depends it depends but what is helpful is when you have friends or maybe a church or maybe a pastor or people around you who are willing to to take you as you are and uh, just understand in their not understanding because you can if if you did not went through such a loss you cannot really understand you can of imagine of course how it is or feels so and when you have people like that around you and we had uh, the we, we were fortunate we had friends a pastor's couple who went through that loss a few years earlier and this couple has helped us tremendously because they knew what we were facing and they did not stop to contact us from time to time with a little telephone call, with a little card, with a little visit, or just maybe uh, uh, a little present. Just letting us know, we still think of you, you are still in our thoughts, you are still in our prayers. And this is the most important thing when people are in this third stage of feeling depressed and lonely, this is the most important thing you do. We just to let them know you are still in their thoughts. In that stage, people said to us, well, we don't want to talk about your loss because we do not know what to say. Yeah, that was my thought that came to my mind when you said, I don't know if I would on my own if I would do that. Because I also had a friend whose um, husband, a childhood friend, in fact, both of them were. And uh, a few years ago, both of them Christians committed suicide suddenly. And um, he had his reasons and we knew he was struggling, but he didn't let anybody close to him to help him anymore. We used to help him, but then it's just he just shut up. There are certain things he had to change in his life and he was not willing to. So he kind of went like turned inwardly and he was a businessman and he was dealing with his business. That was his life. And, uh, you know, obviously. And um, they had children as well and suddenly he committed suicide and uh i wasn't sure how to reach out to her to the, to the widow even yeah. though she's a childhood friend so it's like you almost like you feel like from the perspective of someone who has not gone through that but has friends who have just for the audience i want to, uh, kind of like explaining that it almost feels like you are walking on eggshells around the person because you don't know what you walk into whether it's yeah. going to help or it's going to make situations worse so all i had to say to her that i just want you to know that i'm here anytime you have a, you want to call me or go out for a coffee or just even sleep here or just do something i'm here but i don't know i don't know how to handle this because i don't know what works for you yeah but in that stage for uh, for many people who are suffering uh, such loss it is even difficult to to tell what they want to do because it's like you are in that stage of depression and feeling lonely it's it's like being numb of course you are numb and and your your mind is not functioning as it did before yeah. that loss so you can't tell you it's it's hard to tell right i would like to do that or oh yes that's a good idea let's do that because there is no energy left in you yeah and it's almost like you're walking on the streets and you can't tell whether it's cold or warm, isn't it? 
exactly and i've been to some similar situations and i was well after korean actually <laughs> yeah korean. so yes so I, so, I i in a way yeah i i can a little i can understand a little bit about what you're saying so that's why i said in that stage the the, the most important and effective support the community of friends or family members from the wider family can give is little signs it may be a flower you you put at the doorstep or just or, or give it or send it or a little letter or little somethings some expression of love isn't it? some expression of love and expression of i'm thinking of you i'm praying for you i'm there for you you are not alone i'm with you in that even when i can't really help you but i'm just at your side yes that is the most comforting thing i remember back then there were two friends of mine and they were calling me each week just ringing and just calling me saying how are you i'm thinking of you i'm praying for you and and in asking me how i they gave me the opportunity to talk if i was able to talk yes it was a day where i was able to talk or to say well i don't know how i am yeah and then it was fine both was yes. fine yes did you experience um first of all did you go to grief counseling no no okay so I you did, I, I did on your own we were my husband and i we were thinking about that several times during the first second and third year after the loss but we decided not to do it but rather follow this guideline of um the healthy process of grieving and one of the reasons i'm asking is because some of the things that people say that when you have a you have suffered some kind of trauma uh grief counselors would tell you or you know trauma counselors would tell you to it also helps if you write it out of you if you write it out of you well this is um we we did not want to go to a self-help group mm -hmm. but um um, one of our children, she was writing a lot. She was painting pictures. She was, she was the one who had the graduation yes. ceremony. And um, the pastor called us and he said, well, you don't need to come to this ceremony. We, of course, we, we understand. And, but we did it. Yes. We did it for her. Yes. And this is another advice I want to give. Um, my husband and I, we decided that in the midst of all that despair, of all that depression, loneliness, and pain, we decided to look forward. Yes. And we decided to, to face life, even when we did not know how and to what extent but we decided to focus on the future first of all because of the four children we still had but second of all we instinctively knew and understood that this would be the best we could do not looking backwards all the time even when in this process of grief all your mind is blocked with a loss, all your emotions are blocked with a loss, and all what your soul wants to do is you want to ponder about the loss, which means looking back. It's almost like living in the past. Yes. So, and <laughs> that was the second quality decision we did. We decided we look forward by giving the room we need um, for our soul to walk through that loss. But we focus on the future. That's beautiful. Yeah.
So, and, and then we learned when you are in that stage of depression and loneliness, you think it will never end. Mm. You think for the rest of your life, you, you, you will be with that de depression and that pressure even. It was such a pressure on us. Every normal thing in life was difficult. Yes. And we, we had the fortune, uh, we were in a church back then, which we did not pastor. Um, and for two weeks, the women from the church, each day another woman came and they brought us food, which they had cooked because they said, we can give practical help so that she as the mother who suffered the loss does not need to cook. And I was so grateful mm. because I could not even cook the process. Yeah. I, I could, I just couldn't. So what did you actually do with your days? I sat. Yeah, that's what I thought. I sat on a chair. I sat on the sofa. And since it was end of May, then it was beautiful outside. I sat on the terrace and I just sat and I stared in the air and I that sounds like depression and it, it was it was a thick cloud of depression plus we had the four other children of course and our oldest daughter she would not speak for nearly a year she she shut down yeah so much that I was very concerned about her inner health of course And our oldest son, for one year, repeatedly he said, well, I want to die. I want to go to heaven and be with my little brother. And here we were as parents and we thought, how in the world can we manage that, deal with our own loss? But here are four siblings who are grieving uh, in the same way that we do. They miss their little brother. Of course. So, and, and, the, and the other daughter, she was writing poems and painting pictures. And the other brother, he decided to, he helped himself by being, becoming very, uh, uh, how to say it, outward. He, he just, he went, he met friends all the time. Yeah. And Everybody he, has their own process. Everybody and this is exactly every family member has its own process. And this is a very, very important um, truth that you cannot tell another person in a grieving person how to grieve. Exactly. So there is no right and there is no wrong. There is exactly. no good. And there is no bad. Whatever and works for you is what is the good thing. Whatever works for you. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And that was very important. My husband, he, he went through that process very different than I did. My husband, he, he took a lot in. That's the yes, way he course. is. He yes. is processing things. I think it's also a very, very male thing to do. Yes, so he processed Very different it. from that of a woman. Yes, and I had to find my own ways. I then, after a few months, I realized that I would love to take piano lessons. Good. I needed okay. to find an experience. Finally, a ray of sunshine in the darkness. <laughs> so we, we got a piano. I found a dear lady who gave me piano lessons, so that was my way. And my husband, on the, other, on the other hand, taking it inside, but also he would, to close friends, he would talk. Hmm. So here and there, he would just talk, and then he would talk for one hour or longer. So that was his way. So yes. everyone has his or her own way. Yes. I think it's a good thing that you take up a hobby, especially if something that has to be music or art. I think it's a good thing. I like that. 
It could because be. It all... has to do with your soul, and what you need is your soul to be healed. And I think art can really heal your soul, wouldn't you say? That is true. And also, um, what we started in that time, my husband and I, not every day, but as as often as we could, we would go out for a walk. Mm. Just go out and walk and breathe fresh air and go um, go to a nice surrounding. We, we we had the luck to live in a nice surrounding. We just needed to go out of the house and then we were out in the nature. Nature also heals, doesn't it? Nature heals a lot. Nature heals a lot. And this is the, the first uh, point or the first stage. Um, this couple, this pastor's couple who had suffered a loss of a child a few years before, they gave us the advice, take care of your health. Mm. So this is the first stage because of the um, extreme pain and of the extreme hard work your soul is doing, you need to take care of a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Take care of your sleep. Take care um, to eat healthy and regularly. Don't just, don't just um, skip a healthy daily schedule. Keep on with your schedule as good as you can and take care of your body. Whatever helps your body helps your soul. Yes. Go on a walk, take a bath, or do whatever. exercise. Do exercise because do it releases it releases that particular hormone that you need to feel good. Yes, but do it in in homeopathic <laughs> homeopathic doses. Yes, <laughs> because in in that stage you still do not have energy. Yeah. So don't over exercise, but do something, do, do something, something which where your body can, the muscles can loosen, your body feels away. Just do something, whatever, or go swimming. I know That's, people who run when they have a problem, they go running. Yeah. So <laughs> again, individually, what helps one, one person would say, well, I'm going running. That's that's the best for me. The other person might say, well, going on a walk is the utmost I can do. Mm. So it's, again, it's so different. But, just, but it's so good that you mentioned all these options because this way everybody can select their own. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so for me, I started a season of not only um, taking piano lessons and playing the piano for hours, I also started uh, going in classical concerts. Wow. Because that was something which was did good for my soul. It does. Which, which musicians, I wonder? <laughs> no, seriously, I wonder. In that stage, I listened a lot to Brahms, mm. interestingly. So well, I, I wouldn't recommend Wagner, for instance. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> because you know classical music is good but some of them may not be very good so you want to even be selective there but uh, yeah well i i had we had friends back then uh, both of them were um playing the the violin in a philharmonic orchestra in hamburg they're christians as well so they 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 gave me free tickets <laughs> and in that year brahms was a lot on the schedule but uh, other other musicians, uh, composers, I was uh, listened to was Vivaldi. Yes, Bach probably. Not so much. Bach is uh, the, the majestic <laughs> music very, of, very of Bach can be heavy <laughs> for a burdened soul. No, so no I, Bartok for you then. No Bartok and no list probably because he has <laughs> equally. <laughs> <laughs> so it was Vivaldi and so some light Mozart, Mozart. Hmm? Mozart Mozart yes Mozart I love yes. Mozart He's my yeah it was because part of play seems to be so except for the Requiem of course it's always light yes a sad yeah. life that he had it's unbelievable that he's so playful in his music it always yeah. he always just absolutely amazed me 
that yeah. how can you have a such a life that he had and then produce the music that is completely contrary to that good for <laughs> us good for yeah. us because so back then, light and play, playful to me. Yeah. So back then we did not know André Rieu. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we took what we had in our hands. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's I'm I'm just mentioning this because it is so important to realize that um, working through grief is not a light task. It is a it is a heavy task. It, it takes all your energy and you need all of your strength and all of your focus so and uh, these all these little things like music concert walk little bit of workout or whatever flowers I surrounded myself with flowers. Yes, whatever makes you happy and whatever will be of your yeah. and of the grief. Yes, what every little thing which makes the soul happy or does good for the soul is a help. You know, some people go into during the course of grief, they go into eating a lot. Yes, that's why I said not a good thing. Stay with a healthy lifestyle. Take care of your body. Take care of healthy eating. Because when the soul is working so heavily, it does affect the body. Of course. And that, and that is um, the, the fourth point, that if you do not take care of your body and of a healthy lifestyle, and if you do not take care of that healthy process of grieving you might experience physical symptoms of distress exactly yeah so and then another point and that is the fifth point is um in that in that stage the loss is maybe now a few months ago uh, in that stage, you, you start to realize that your mental energy has, is diminished. Mm. And you cannot go on uh, as you were used to. And that is a phase where some people who are experiencing loss and going through a grieving process, they might become panicky mm. because they think, but what? in the world what did happen to me I, I, i'm hindered to think i'm i'm hindered to be the quick and flexible thinker or creative thinker i have used to be i i do not have all these ideas or inspirations i used to have there is just like blank mm. and that makes some people panic in this stage but it is, um, it is a normal part. That is, it is a normal part of the grieving process. Um, um, the inability to concentrate in time of grief is just as natural as it can be. Of course, because so, all your energy is turned towards, you know. Exactly. It's yeah. survival mode, so you practically have no more capacity for doing anything else. But that will pass too. Exactly, that will pass too. So don't be concerned when when you feel your your mental flow is blocked or when when you are not as productive as you have been before. That will pass for sure, as the depression uh, and the sense of loneliness will pass away. In in that time. I used to, to tell myself that after each night comes a new morning. Yes. After each sunset and the darkness of night comes a new sunrise. I did not know when, I did not know how, but I stuck with this picture. And I told myself repeatedly over months, and months and months that there will be a new sunrise, that there will be a new dawning of day and a new life after this. That's beautiful. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, and, and in this, in this stage or in this, and I, again, I want to say, I, I call it stages, but sometimes the stages are mingled. The depression, yeah. loneliness stage is mingled with the panicking. And so this is just a kind of guideline I'm giving out of here. Course. And something from your own experience. So people will yes. be very credible. Yes. And so, and I want to encourage because this is what we did as well we pushed ourselves mm -hmm. you're naturally you you want maybe to become passive mm -hmm. because of all the pain the low level of energy and all the grieving but from time to time push yourself for example push yourself to be open to new relationships push yourself and get up in the morning i would say isn't it okay. i mean that's the first step most people don't get out of the bed and i'm not you know very good down, point. But I think that would, because this is what i'm hearing you know depression one of the signs of depression people don't even want to get out of the bed i well, can't this, understand that but i know i heard this so many times that yes well that part is a difficulty you are totally right and keep your schedule. This is something I had to do because I had four children in school. I had to get out of bed in the morning. I had to prepare yeah. breakfast. So I had to. But this was because I had to. There was no option. I no. could not choose. And that was helpful. Yes. It helped me and the whole family that we kept with our Daily normal life schedule. as much as possible yeah yes that we, we we had to cope with the normal life so but push yourself to think new thoughts as i thought well piano lessons might be a good thing or um go out and be nice to people and it might sound challenging but i also want to challenge. say you don't even sometimes, in the morning yeah you just want to yeah. sit of course it's challenging sometimes it is it might be healthy and good for you to to set aside your own grief yeah and focus on other people yeah be nice to them and maybe help other yeah. people in their difficulties exactly don't circle around your grief all the time push yes, yourself out and outward focus on other people focus on life focus on what you still can do even if it might be the littlest of thing but you can do something a yeah. little something baby steps yeah and push yourself to do something that is pleasant for you hmm. be nice to yourself be nice to yourself <laughs> yes pet yourself it's <laughs> Give yourself a nice cake. <laughs> well, <laughs> something, whatever makes your soul happy at that time, I think you need to allow it for yourself. Yes. In moderation, obviously, but yeah, yeah. So what whatever. So yeah. And and then then came a, a time, and that is another phase. Um when all of a sudden, uh, my husband and I, we faced this nagging, painful, questioning, this sense of guilt. Mm. Should we have done some things different? Should we have done some things earlier? Should we have called the children's doctor earlier? Should we have go to the hospital earlier? Should we have stayed in the hospital even when it was not allowed back then? There's nothing you could have done, it seems to me. It, it is true. There's nothing we could have done differently. But what I want to point out is that as a normal, healthy part of the grieving process, people um, might feel a sense of guilt. Of course. I, th I think it's very true, yeah. Also, what I wanted to ask, when that doctor came over and he explained all this from the medical standpoint, did that help you? Yes, it helped us. And, and I, I assume he probably said that there's nothing you could have done. He did say that. And that was a tremendous help. Okay. Because, so we, we for sure understood 
that from the medical point of view, we 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 did we did all what we could do and, and we did the right thing. Of course, there was nothing. There was nothing else what we could have done. Yeah, yeah. So, but just I just want to mention that because um, when we were working with other couples or people who had faced a loss, um, this is something when people are in that phase of um, asking themselves these questions or having the sense of guilt, they are ashamed. Mm. they are ashamed there is a sense of shame as well and we we ourselves had to walk through that as well and to work with shame it. regarding what exactly maybe i i i should have done this or i should have talked to guilt. you mean guilt guilt, guilt. yes guilt. Mm. guilt yeah so shame because of that sense of guilt okay so and and just saying that there is a, a, a normal sense of guilt. And of course, then there is a neurotic guilt. But in a way, it might be a part of the grieving process. Yes. So and when it's natural for your mind to question all these things, to start reasoning, it's very natural, isn't it? Exactly. It is still a sign that your mind and your soul is trying to cope with the loss and process yes and 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 trying to process process it through yeah yeah so Maybe. and it might help in that stage that you are reaching out for a trained person in that stage i was reaching out to a friend of mine she she is a psych psychologist and i i because i sense that in this phase, I could not help myself. Uh -huh. So I, I reached out to her. I called her. I said, listen, can I, can I come for one hour? Please, could you check me? Mm. So I went and she, she said, well, uh, you don't have to pay for this hour. This is my, my gift for you. This is my help I can give you. And she checked me for one hour. And then she said to me, you know what? Everything is fine. You are in the total normal part and way of a total healthy process of grieving. It's just fine. Just continue. All is well. That's wonderful. It's and good that, this insurance. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that is what you might, as a person who has suffered a loss, you might want to do it one time or maybe maybe several times. Go to a trained person and get a check. Make sure you are on the on the on the right process on the right yes. path. Yeah, Pass yeah. It's basically um, process of grief. It seems to me is a process. It's a journey to your healing. It is a journey. I think it's probably a better way to look at it. It's like everything I'm going through now, it's a, it's a step forward for me to my complete healing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, a, it's a good way you are putting it. It's a journey to the healing. And sometimes the journey goes around curves. <laughs> <laughs> you do not see the you end. It's not as straightforward, really? <laughs> <laughs> So, and also, you know, and I'm um, glad you mentioned that because I think, uh, coming from my angle anyway, sometimes we just have to be patient with ourselves, isn't it? Yes. Because, you know, depend on, depending on the mentality of people, I, per, I personally like to think, get things done fast. And this is not something you can get done fast, isn't it? Nope. <laughs> you can't. You have to be taking your time and allowing yourself to go through all that process. And there is no quick way to that, isn't it? No. No, actually, uh, yeah, we we met people who wanted to do it that way, and it it was a big boomerang. It came back yeah, it comes three back. times bigger to them because you cannot fast forward uh, your process. Plus, you cannot dictate your soul yeah. how fast your soul has to process. Exactly, you cannot. You just cannot. You have to accept the pace your soul is choosing yes that 
simple as it is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and we, we don't like it sometimes. <laughs> we would like to be through very quick and yeah. fast and yeah. Put and everything behind us, forgetting what lies behind and facing forward, what lies ahead. And you know what? <laughs> True. But well, yeah. it does not always work that way. But not always. And you have to allow your own process because whatever works for you is the best process for you. Yeah, it yeah, it's true. So and and then I I I entered a phase, and that is the seventh stage of this um process. I found myself being very filled with anger mm. and resentment. There was a phase I was very mad at God. I was angry at God. I was <laughs> angry at life. I, I was just angry. And it took me a while to, to realize that this is also part of the normal process because when the depression lifts, sometimes the depression lifts quick and in, a, in an instant, but in many cases, the depression lifts gradually mm -hmm. and the loneliness. And Does it ever lift from one minute to the next? I never heard of it, unless it's something spiritual. I always heard that it's a process, like less, like coming out of a fog, isn't it? Yeah, but but as you said, some people are because of their personality. This process is quick and fast. Okay. While other people, because of their personality, it's it's a long and a slow process, which is sometimes very challenging for those who are around of that person. Yes, because of it is long and slow. Yeah. But that person uh, in that process needs again and again and again the confirmation that all will be well. Yes. You have and to all is going to be fine. Yeah. Yes. So, but, but then there might be, I remember um, as pastors, we, we had in our church a lady, she lost her husband uh, also from one day to another. Wow. And there she was, a widow with four little children. Wow. And we were so glad that we already knew this grieving process. So we really could help her through every stage. But the, the and she is a good example. She had in between of these different stages, but then also for a few months, she was so angry and mad at her husband yeah i understand that <laughs> he was so mad he just left me with the four children and she was super angry yeah but it was just another part yeah. of her process it was just i was mad at corinne too i was mad at her <laughs> <laughs> for not yeah. taking care of herself and for not you know yes so i i can relate yeah yeah, true. Yeah. But um, well, and uh, it is and some and then she would be very ashamed mm -hmm. and she would or say, well, this way. It, how can I talk about my husband? Because he was the love of my life. And it, it really was so. And now I'm so mad and angry at him. So it was like going back and forth. So and in, in, in this when, when you are in this phase, all it takes is just be honest with you, mm. allow it, but channel it. The Bible says anger, in your, when you are angry, in your anger, sin not. Mm. So it's then, okay to be angry. Yeah, it's okay it, to be angry. Tell the audience, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to <laughs> be angry. You know, yeah. some people don't know that. Christians don't know that. <laughs> I just have a friend, she's wonderful. And uh, she was talking about this, this deep set anger in herself and just the process, how she, because she had some issues in the past and she's just working through that and she's going to come on the show some other time. But uh, she said, you know, I don't even know if at this, at this stage of me going through this process, you even want me on your show because I feel like I'm so angry. I have nothing to give. But I, I had to remind her of the scripture that God, God is angry every day. That's what the Bible says. So 
anger is not really the issue. What you do with it is the issue, isn't it? Exactly. You, you can use anger and transform it in something that fuels exactly. your life. 